Hello, I'm Antonio Sampaio, and this is Sounds Strategic, the podcast of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. And I'm here with my co-host, Maya. Hi, I'm Maya Nowens. So, um, greetings from this storm-battered um, London. Uh, and we're going to move today to a topic from another stormy area of international politics, which is, of course, the Middle East. Uh, and we're going to be discussing reactions and repercussions of uh, President Donald Trump's peace plan for the Middle East. So, on the 28th of January, Trump unveiled his vision for Israel and Palestine, calling it the ultimate deal. Of course, a lot of people disagree with that. So um, we're here to discuss this with uh, Sir Tom Beckett, the executive director of our um, IISS Middle East based in Bahrain. Uh, Sir Tom is the uh, organizer of the annual IISS Manama Dialogue and the Sherpa meetings and contributes to the Institute's research on the Middle East and North Africa. He enjoyed a 34-year career in the British Army and also worked for the British government as defense senior advisor to the Middle East and North Africa. So um, this uh, the, the, the plan laid out by Trump contains quite a few innovations, let's say, on previous ones, uh, especially rega re regarding Jerusalem and uh, the Jordan uh, Riverbank. So... Um, which of these points have been the, the most problematic with, uh, with actors on the ground? Um, well, it's interesting because the, 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 the view, and I know we're going to come on to it, the view from the Gulf is not that it's problematic. I think the, what I would probably look at is, is more of the, the plan in detail to begin with. And if you look at what um, Jared Kushner, the, the president's special advisor on this, said was that um, he, he cast it in two things. First of all, that... Palestinian leadership had been absent. Um, he didn't make a similar comment about Israeli leadership, which has not um, been um, notably better. Um, and he also said that history uh, had been an impediment. Uh, it, it, had been, it had made the solving of this, of the Palestinian problem, or, or, um, more difficult. And so the, the reporting or the, the, the view is that the, um, the deal was written almost in the absence of history. Um, and I think one of the things that when, when looking through the deal, one of the things that caught my eye was that um, so it, uh, Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel um, to the exclusion of the Palestinians. And the Palestinians will be given an area to the, to the east of Jerusalem called Abu Dis, which is a little settlement you know, from Ottoman times. Um, and, and if the Palestinians choose to, they can call it Al-Quds, which is Jerusalem. And you just think, well, Al-Quds in the early days of Islam was the Qibla. It was the direction to which you prayed before the, the, dire the direction was changed to, um, to Mecca. I mean, it's an incredibly important thing. And to think that the Palestinians themselves could unilaterally call a little village to the, to the east of um, Al-Quds, Al-Quds, is just, it just it's countercultural. So I think some of the things in, in, in the detail of the plan just look so curiously odd that I find it hard to see how it'll be implemented. But one thing that is, is notable is that people appreciate that something has to change um, if there's going to be a solution. And so what you saw to begin with from many of the Gulf governments was, um, uh, and it was for two reasons, but uh, saying that um, they welcomed the efforts that the Trump administration had put into coming up with a plan. Um, because it might move things on. And initially, um, most of them said the, the start point is now negotiations between Palestine and Israel. Now, of course, Palestine had not been included in any of the negotiations for the plan and had said ca categorically that they would not negotiate the plan with Israel, so that was never going to happen. But the second thing of, of, the, of their, the initial governmental response from the region um, was that it looked more like... Uh, demonstrating cooperation with the Trump administration than happiness with a plan. So what have the responses been in the region from countries that you've seen? So, I mean, I think probably one of the number of elements, but I think the, the first one is, is the pragmatic piece. So um, again, um, what uh, Jared Kushner said was that the plan has got to reflect the facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the time when he said that, a lot of a lot of commentator the commentariat was saying, "What does that mean? That international law is no no longer relevant. Only the strong prevail." Um, and and 
you know, you could say, Maya, from your area, that it seems a little bit different from the uh, South China Sea, the American approach to the South China Sea. That's right. But um, but you know, that, that it was to reflect the facts on the ground. Um, but the facts on the ground is that this has been an in, intractable problem for decades. And how do you move it forward? Um, and so Anwar Gargash, who's the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs in the United Arab Emirates, um, after... Um, the extraordinary Arab League meeting in the Organization of Islamic Constru uh, Cooperation said um, that the organizations must come out with a constructive stance and tweeted that it is important for the Arab League and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation to come out with a constructive stance that goes beyond the statements of condemnation. And I think that's quite an important statement, you know, coming from an Arab country, the United Arab Emirates, which many reporters think has one of the closer relationships with, with, with Israel because of the Iranian, their concerns about Iran. Um, that was an important pragmatic point. But then you go from that original piece to then those two meetings, the Arab League and the OIC meeting, where the plan is condemned. Um, uh, and the, there's a unified stance that, the, that no one will discuss it with Israel, so that, so that they won't discuss it with Israel. Um, and, and that is more reflective of the views of the population of the region. So. We in the Middle East office did a bit of looking at what, what was coming out. So we looked at the government positions, which I've reflected there, and then not, not rowing back, but just um, saying what they've always said. You've got to respect the Palestinian rights, 1967, Oslo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we've got to have, not this new drawing up of a plan. Um, so that was the government stance. The government or newspapers in the region, and pretty well all of them have a governmental affiliation, were allowed to be quite um, uh, to, to express opposition to the plan. In some ways, that's quite good because the government's going to have a pragmatic, you know, sort of we've got to live in the 21st century response. But their papers can talk to the population and say the things that the population want to hear. The question then is, is that the, what the population actually thinks in the, in the Gulf region? And our looking at that and dividing it up into sort of 50 to 70, 30 to 50, and then and then younger age group is that predominantly yes, it's still. It is still seen, whether it's ideological or religious, um, that the Palestinian people need a homeland. Um, it's very much an ideological stance for older people. For younger people, it's it's also a human rights piece. You know, a nation should have an there should be nationhood, and they should have a, they should have a place. Um, and and only occasionally do you find um, people, and they're normally in the policy making arena talking about how do we actually take this forward, reflecting what um, Dr. Anwar Gargash, the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs said. So um, public perception in the region um, remains that this is, a, this, is a, this is a very sensitive subject. And I think the governments of the region know that. You know, they know that they've got to move it on, but at the same time, they can't lose their constituents. So going back to the um, the document that originated this response, the, the Trump plan, it seems that uh, the U.S. government is saying we have to put history a little bit in the back seat and take a more pragmatic approach. But even if you look through a pragmatic approach, um, there are elements of the plan that have been criticized on that front. So, for instance, the issue of water access. So, obviously, the Jordan River, uh, the, the plan says that it would be under sovereignty of uh, Israeli sovereignty. Um, and the areas that are being given to, to the Palestinians, the Negev Desert, are, you know, a desert. Um, so, so how, how um, have this... The, this what seems like a very obvious problem in the plan has this been addressed by the the actors involved how much com, uh, you know um, uh, uh, pushback has that um, uh, erupted in in the region well i think i think because the plan was kept um, uh, so um, uh, and kept confidential for so long that people didn't know what the actual details would be and that was deliberate i think it was the um, american ambassador to israel said we're, we're not, go and this is a, the last year, I think, and I, I, hopefully I'm, I'm, uh, so, I'm uh, paraphrasing him correctly. We're not going to release the details because when we do, people get killed. So, um, so, so they they deliberately didn't. They didn't um, negotiate with the Palestinians. The Palestinians weren't going to negotiate with them in any case. Um, so, so this was done in isolation, and as a result. Um, it favors Israel. It favors the, it favors the, the facts on the ground. It favors the, the settlements. It favors um, Israel's position. It favors Israel's security, whether it's water security or national security. 
I wonder then about the timing of its release. How much do you think this is related to the um, the plan actually having been decided in its entirety because it was the right time to release it? It was done uh, from their perspective, from the U.S.'s perspective, or do you think it's been timed um, for domestic political reasons instead? Um. It's tricky to know for sure. I mean, I think with a year, well, with 11 months to go in an election campaign, it's plenty of time for the plan to be consigned to the dustbin, which cannot be good if you said that you are going to secure the deal of the century um, for the most intractable problem in the world. So, but it did come out um, at the time of the impeachment. So it was quite distracting there. And it did come out when um, Prime Minister Netanyahu was seeking um, for, for when there's coming up for an Israeli a, a re-election um, and, and wants to remain in power, not the least so that he doesn't get sent to prison. Right. And what has, do you know what the domestic public opinion reaction has been in Israel to the plan? Um, most of the Israeli newspapers that I've looked at are supportive of it, and that's no surprise. If it secures Israeli secure, if it, if it guarantees Israeli security, um, uh, allows Israelis who've gone into the settled in the in the Palestinian areas their their the ability to stay there um, and is weighted in their favour. Then yes, but I, but I think I would be uh, I'd be hard to find where I where I read it, but there is disquiet. Um, there are elements of Israeli society that don't see this as fair and and um, a fair deal for the Palestinians. Right, a range of opinions, um, yeah. understandably. Yes. But I think it's interesting that you say that it might not. Um, that it might have been a premature move on the U.S.'s part with, as you said, 11 months to go in the yeah. in the U.S. election. I mean, if as you're, I think you're right to say that if it doesn't work out, that will be, I think, a, a little bit of an obstacle, um, I suppose, in terms of delivering on promises. Although, I mean, because in the scale of the of the, the longevity of this problem, 11 months is such a short space of time that you could say, don't worry, in the next administration, we'll make it work. Uh, good point. And uh, on these uh, political um, reactions to the uh, to the deal and, and internal audiences, it also seems like um, there's a problem of sustainability of this plan because there are, it's it it departs so much from tradition that some actors have already said that they are not so. For instance, Bernie Sanders has said that you know this is uh, an unacceptable plan, etc. Um, and I presume that actors inside Israel have also, as you said, like uh, said that it's it's, it's unfair. Uh, and also the fact that um, the new map drawn by this plan sort of surrounds the Palestinian territories with Israel um, sovereignty. Um, so is there a concern among uh, the authors of this plan and the broader region that um, uh, even if in the unlikely case that you know the Palestinians could perhaps um, be um, amenable to a, a something close to this plan, that it wouldn't be sustainable in the first place because other political actors afterwards would just you know scrap it. Yes, I mean I think from the very start is saying that it's a it's an enactable plan. There there may be elements of it, and and one of the. Um, regional uh, foreign ministers or assistant foreign ministers did say, let's look at some of the elements that are workable within it. I'm, I'd need to check who it was. So there may be parts of it, but whenever anyone produces a plan like this, they say, don't cherry pick from it. You've got to do it in the whole, but you can't do this one in the whole. So so um, with America and Israel, I'm sure they would think that they can do what they want to do. I mean, it was interesting, as I said, after the um, after the Arab League and OIC meetings that um, Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, said that he was going to immediately annex those those parts of uh, Palestinian territory that they were in. And when they saw the response, when the US saw the response, um, the ambassador, or reportedly the ambassador, said, "No, you can't." For the first thing is that you know the map doesn't actually define the ground yet; it's just a piece of paper with some goose eggs on it. So they've got to actually do that. So that's been put off until after the election. Where, where, as things stand now, um, where do we go from here? Is there uh, an attempt um, by the US or? perhaps Middle Eastern governments that are more sympathetic to this deal to recover, as you said, aspects of the deal that are um, that are more doable? Um, or is it a complete uh, stall, a complete 
uh, halt to 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 whatever plan this is. Yeah, I mean, I think my my guess would be that it's a uh, stall is one word. It's it's waiting to see what America proposes next. America's put this out. People will reflect on it. They'll they'll look at the detail of it. Um, the statements have been made by by the Arab governments and by the by their um, intergovernmental organizations, and they're really now waiting to see what's next. Um, and until they see what's next, they won't know how to respond. Um, and but they will always, as I've said previously, they'll be conscious of their own constituency and what the view on the ground will be there. Um, inevitably, though, this is a you know like with anything, um, this is a if you're sitting in a man, if you're a Jordanian. This is a much more pressing problem than if you're sitting in, you know, Abu Dhabi or Manama. You know, it's a long way away. And so what your your reaction in those parts is more of a historical totemic reaction rather than a this is real and it's land and it's security. So and as time goes on, that um, that the, the urgency of solving it or the imperative to solve it will diminish and, and the youth will. And I think that's why people need to. It, it, for for all the ill that is in this plan, something has to change. The, as Anwar Gaga said, you can't just keep saying, can't just keep condemning everything. We've actually got to do something about it. The reality is that I don't think that the Arab states on their own can do anything about it. Um, they need America, and they've already said they need American leadership to see what they can get out of this. Well, it'll be interesting to see how this develops then in the next year or so. It'll be very interesting because... The American leadership has been in the region has been somewhat patchy recently. <laughs> now, if you're someone who is involved in security policy analysis or research, you might be interested to hear about the new edition of the Military Balance. The IISS has been publishing it for over 60 years, and it covers 171 countries around the world. Inside the book, you'll find analysis of each country's armed forces how much they're spending on defense, and how new technology is shaping the future of warfare. Featuring color graphics and a pull-out wall chart, it really is a very useful reference for anyone who wants to understand the world's militaries. It's just been published, and you can find out more on www.iiss.org. So moving on to our next section, I was wondering, Tom, whether you could extrapolate on some key moments and events that you think have uh, shaped the region to what it is today. Okay, I will. And um, bearing in mind that we talked about um, the Trump plan being anti-historical, I'm not going to go very far back in time. I'm really just going to go back to 1979. And there were three um, important events in 1979 that um, had a began to shape the region as we see it today. And the first was the um, uh, the ousting of the Iranian monarchy in February 79 and the establishment of the Islamic Republic in, in on the 1st of April 1979. And so what what you what you had there was um, uh, it, it was a very it was it, it, it's it resonated with with the people of the region. Um, there was an established there was Islamic nationalism was involved. Uh, both Sunni and Shia admired the fact that there was a country that was that was run under under uh, religious uh, precepts, um, and so it it served as an example. Um, it was an important example. Um, what the downside to it was was that um, Iran's immediate position was that it needed to expand that revolution, um, and one of the things that got in the way of that revolution, which they had no. Uh, no admiration for whatsoever was the Gulf monarchies. So it immediately put the Iran and the Gulf monarchies on a, on an adversarial uh, in an adversarial position. But underlying that, um, the Islamic religious nationalist piece was was important. Um, uh, you know, most most um, uh, up until um, probably two thousand. Well, up until two thousand three, two thousand six. Uh, Hezbollah would have been very popular, notwithstanding the fact that they're a Shia, um, um, uh, Shia group working um, alongside and with Iran. The second event, um, which ha- which happened in in seventy nine, was twentieth of November nineteen seventy nine, which is the first day of Muharram fourteen hundred in the Islamic calendar, so the first day of the year, and that was when. Um, uh, a group called JSM um, took over the Mecca, took over the Grand Mosque in Mecca, um, led by a chap called J- Jahayman Ibn Muhammad bin, bin Saif al-Atabi. And essentially his 
and he brought with him the Mahdi, the man who would, you know, that the, the, the end of time would come and, 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 and the world would be made safe again. Um, so, but his, the bottom line was that he was an Islamist, a Sunni Islamist, who viewed that, his, that, um, Saudi, uh, that Saudi rulers had, had fallen from the path of true Islam. Too much innovation called bidda, um, and that they needed to go back to a purer time. Uh, of course, that that the the, the the siege of the Grand Mosque was uh, was was brought to an end, um, and and the and and that was put to one side. But the reaction um, in Saudi was: Is this a groundswell view? Do we need to be more conservative? Do we need to go back to a more conservative time of the interpretation of our religion? Um, and that's that's effectively what happened. And what you see um, is the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, saying we need to take Saudi back to a time before 1979. And, and so, you know, if you first hear him talk about it, you think he's oh, he's talking about the Islamic Revolution. He's talking about Iran and Iran's behavior. He's not. He's talking about behavior inside Saudi Arabia, as he would say. You know, um, he said we have. You know, on, if you go on YouTube, you see people dancing and music and singing in Saudi. Um, but that stopped after 79. He said, we, women used to drive in Saudi until we brought in driving licenses and then we stopped them. You know, so he wants to go back to, as he says, to a more um, liberal interpretation. So, but, but it was important that because it did, um, Saudi did become more conservative. And I think the takeover of the mosque did um, light an Islamic, Islamist fuse. So the next event that was important was the... Um, at the beginning of the Soviet-Afghan war in December 79, because even though you know the, the numbers are small, you know three, four thousand, maybe maybe more, Arab Arabs went to fight in Afghanistan or went to Afghanistan. Actually, not many of them did fighting. It was a way to. Um, it was easy to send the the Takfiri jihadis to go and fight there. So the problem could leave the country, the borders of the country. So a lot went from. Algeria and a lot went from Saudi Arabia. And at the end of the Afghan war, they came back. So you then have, um, so the, 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 the Afghan war ends in um, uh, 1989, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, 1989. Um, and you have the Af what, they, what they even called themselves, the Afghan Arabs came back. Um, their ideology much stronger, their Islamist ideology much stronger. And that's where, from which 9-11 comes from and so on and so forth. Um, so those three events are really important. The Islamic Revolution in 79, the takeover of the mosque and the conservatization of Saudi Arabia, um, and then the ability to uh, export or to allow the problem children of that conservative element of is, uh, the Islamist element to go and fight in, in the Afghan war, not recognizing that they're going to come back and come back to haunt us. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was that part. And then you had 9-11, you had the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, American-led invasion of Af Afghanistan. Um, at the same time in 1989, it's, we shouldn't forget that the Berlin Wall came down, and that was really important from our own Western perspective. You know, when I joined the army in 1984, until the wall came down, we sat there as a deterrent to the Soviet Union. Um, one of our uh, chiefs of the general staff, uh, General Sir Peter Wall, said after, uh, you know, when we were stuck in Iraq and Afghanistan, said, um, who would have thought when we were sitting in the, East, on the West German plains defending German, the West against Russia or the Soviet Union that would be campaigning on, in Mesopotamia and on the Hindu Kush, mm -hmm. just as all of our forefathers in the British Empire had been doing. So, but it was, you know, that was an important part because um, we had been, 1989, up until then, Western, it was the high politics of nuclear deterrence and it was a focus on Europe. Meanwhile, all of these other proxy wars could go on around the world. One of those proxy wars, of course, being the Afghan war and the Saudi support, monetary support for it and America's support for it against Russia. Uh, a lesson that the, the jihadis took from it, of course, and as they've said, um, was that they brought down the Soviet Union. Um, not all the economic and structural factors that actually existed inside the, um, the which is which is an important um, uh, 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 clarion call for the for the um, uh, Islamists. So so eighty nine was again important. It also meant that um, troops that were otherwise sitting on the West German plain could go and defend Kuwait or liberate Kuwait when Saddam Hussein invaded in ninety one. 
Um, but meanwhile, the the Islamist threat, because Islamists, you can have Shia Islamists and Sunni Islamists, but the, the Islamist threat that stems from the Sunnah um, was, uh, was was growing to the extent that you then had 9-11. The response to 9/11 was the was the uh, invasion of Afghanistan, and then in 2003, the invasion of Iraq. Um, and I was um, I was as a as a commanding officer, I was part of that invasion. And at the time, it seemed to make sense. Um, looking back, I would say I think it's probably the greatest strategic mistake of 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 uh, the 21st century. Uh, and why? Because whether you liked him or not, and one shouldn't. Um, uh, forget that Saddam Hussein was a was a tyrant and a dictator, um, what, but what, but what Iran or what Iraq did do was it contained Iran, um, and once Iraq was knocked over and went into a state of anarchy um, and was ungovernable, ungovernable largely, um, Iran could then reassert its or could assert its political um, will into the into the corridors of power in Baghdad. Um, and and go on from there. So Iran was no longer contained in the way that it had been. So 2003 was really important. And then 2006 was the next uh, important milestone, and that was the Israeli-Hezbollah war, um, when um, Hezbollah will claim that they were victorious. And they have some reason to claim that because they weren't defeated. And in, if uh, non-state actors not being defeated may, often means you've won. Um, but again, the, their, their response to the Israeli, um, uh, Israeli uh, the, in, the, in that war was again held up with pride. There was Arab pride, didn't matter whether you were Shia or Sunni, there was Arab pride and the ability that this um, group could take on Israel and prevail. So that was a, that was a really important event as well. Um, and then with an uncontained Iran, um, the, the, and it was really in the 2010s, people, and we all know that the awareness of the Iranian nuclear program became public. Um, what was also became known was that, was that a country was not going to stand for I I Iran having a nuclear capability. And in the euphemism, it was that there was always concern that there was going to be a third party strike on Iran which would then cause a Gulf War. And that third party, of course, is Israel. So the, the way that you stopped having that third party strike was to enter the negotiations to uh, curtail Iran's nuclear program. And that's where, from where the JCPOA came from. Um, so those are, the, those are, I think, are the really important um, events, years, years and events that have occurred. I mean, okay, I, I didn't join the army till 1984, and I'm citing 1979, but I was a, I was a kid, a teenager in Bahrain in 1979, and the Afghan war started and the Islamic revolution started and the Mecca takedown started. And so I saw those things, albeit sitting in the middle of the Arabian, Arabian Gulf. Um, so, but it, so it's part of my, my lifetime and what I've seen as the changes there. And thanks for sharing it with us. It was a, uh, an excellent um, uh, briefing on, on, on the history of, of the region. Uh, and the, what caught my attention, and I've already warned you that I'm, uh, I would ask about non-state armed groups in this podcast, uh, the closer uh, the, the the closer we got in your uh, history to 9/11 and you know the Iraq and, and recent times, my sense is that um, the the more relevant uh, and impactful non-state armed groups have become in the region. Um, you know, the story of the Iraq War is a uh, you know is a pretty much you know an insurgency and and several other you know militia groups um, um, and even the Palestinian authority currently emerged out of um, armed movements against Israel. So, um, and obviously the ISS has recently released a strategic dossier on, on um, proxy and networks of influences uh, for, uh, for Iran in, in the Middle East. So, in your sense, if, if it's not too broad a question, um, why do you think, if you agree, that non-state armed groups have become, you know, critical uh, in recent times as opposed to more um, um, previous decades, and why that has come about? You know, as a generalism, the non-state armed groups are either stem from the Sunni or stem from the Shia. Um, the Shia ones are, um, are supported uh, or follow the ideology of the Islamic Republic. Um, so so they, they are, there's, there's a state sponsorship piece there. 
um, the Sunni ones, that's not the case. And, and over the course of, of, of the, the rise of the radical Sunni jihadis, um, as it became apparent that the, the risks were um, uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the Arab nations were, were rising, their, their own regime, their own um, uh, security regimes clamped down to try and solve that problem, genuinely try and solve that problem. You know, the, um, there's always a characterization that, um, the, the, as, 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 and they don't like to be called it, but the Sunni-led um, countries exported it and supported it. Um, they didn't. People, people inside those, you know, wealthy people or whatever may have had an ideological affinity to them, but the governments didn't. And you know, if you look at Saudi Arabia's response to its own Al Qaeda threat, it was it was incredibly focused, very effective, because they realised it was a it was an existential threat to them. And it is an existential threat because if you look at um, whether it's the Muslim Brotherhood or the later iterations of that Islamist threat. Um, what they don't see, what they 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 don't um, agree with, is that there are monarchies, um, that the ummah the, the, um, can be ruled by different parts, um, and so therefore they are, um, from their very stance, they are anti the the the, the, the government stance, um, and so that is a threat. You know, if you're if you're if you're a, a Gulf monarchy, um, the Islamists directly threaten your rule of your of your territory. Um, and so, how do you deal with it? So you have those armed groups, you know, whether it was Al Qaeda in the um, uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq or Al Qaeda in um, the Arabian Peninsula or whatever. Those are those are an armed group. Um, you then have, and the one that our dossier were focused on were the groups that um, are aligned or um, with Iran. Um, we we chose the terminology to call them partners rather than proxies because there's different. Um, levels of cooperation, different levels of support, different levels of ideological affinity. Um, but again, um, the Western response uh, for so long was focused on um, the threat that came from the Sunnah, not the threat that came from the Islamic Republic through those armed groups. Um, the and why? I mean, it made sense. You know, the 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 um, people were being killed in Europe and in America by um, Sunni jihadis, not by Shia jihadis. Um, so that was the focus, and it was pretty all-consuming. And even if you look at the military response in Iraq, the majority of the counter-terrorist response was focused on the, on the, um, uh, the Sunni jihadis, not, there was a smaller element that dealt with those, the, the, the Iranian-supported Shia jihadis, um, or Shia militias, as they would prefer to be, well, they wouldn't even prefer to be called that, but never mind. Um, uh, so, so the so the the Western policy preferred dealing with the Sunni threat, not the Shia threat. Apart from that particular Iranian Shia threat, which was the nuclear program, and so what it didn't do was have a balanced response to all of the others. Um, I mean, it was and there wasn't the bandwidth here in the United Kingdom that, that to have the whilst faced with all of those threats that came from the Sunni, there wasn't there wasn't the bandwidth to deal with the threats that came from the from the Shia. So what struck me in your uh, your outline of the main events that have shaped the region um, to what it is today is that comment that you made about um, in the 1980s, in the lead up to what would eventually be the Gulf War, um, all eyes were on Europe, uh, largely, and um, that in the background, uh, other problems were, were left to ferment. I was wondering whether you see a correlation today with a... a perhaps a fear in the region of the United States um, focusing its foreign policy more towards China and towards East Asia and what that means for the United States commitment to um, maintaining a presence in the Middle East. Yes, I mean, it's, it's a really good point. I mean, the um, I think the, the, an acknowledged concern for the region is American uh, the American attitude to it, its policy position towards the region. So during the Trump admin, or the, the um, Obama administration, the view was that Obama was anti anti the region. Um, he didn't particularly like the Israelis, and he didn't particularly like the Arab governments either. And the Democratic position was to withdraw, to draw down in in that region. As they'll all say now, they would they would have drawn down sensibly. Um, and so the, the 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 Trump policy, Trump's administration's policy, is not particularly different. You know, it is it's a withdrawal from commitments in the region. It's a withdrawal from being the security guarantor, um, which if which 
which concerns them because it's been a security guarantor for so long that they look elsewhere to how they're going to fill that. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean I agree that um, uh, whilst 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 we were focused on the Soviet Union in the in the uh, in the eighties, um, the region is not sure who to focus on as their as their protector. Um, they know that they prefer America, but there's a there's a there's almost an instinctive reaction that they have to favor America. Right. And so how much do you think they might look towards China? We've seen that China has um, increased its uh, diplomatic relationships with countries in uh, well, across the Middle East. Um, it uh, looks to Gulf states um, perhaps for contributing to financing of the Belt and Road Initiative. So those that relationship seems to be expanding, um, perhaps in some areas deepening our Gulf states and um, other countries in the region looking to China to diversify those foreign relations. Yes, I think they are. I think they. I think they. They hope that America will remain committed, but they're planning for the worst. So they um, they realize that they've got to look to the east. They've got to look to the economies of the east, and they've got to look to the, to, to to there for some of their some of the things that they would previously have expected to get from America. Um, but it does, and that hope bit. Is reflected in their response to the, the the Palestinian deal. Let's not be uncooperative because if we're not uncooperative, we'll be seen as useful, we'll be seen as allies, um, and we won't lose that American investment. But at the same time, they are realists. They see that it's that it's it's weakening, and they have to go elsewhere for for some of their um, uh, for, for to to diversify their support. And certainly on the economic side. They look to India, they look to China, and they look to the Far East for how they can diversify their economic protections. Right. And what about on the arms import side, if I may, uh, studying China? I don't want to monopolize this conversation on China-Middle East relations. We have an excellent um, new uh, researcher at the Middle East office, Camille Lons, who looks at uh, China-Middle East relations um, and will be active in this area in the future. But I do want to touch upon the question of Chinese arms exports to uh, the Middle East, particularly in drone technology. Is that another do you think symptom of them diversifying their relationships, or it is. is that just meeting a need? Uh, well, it was it, it's it's both because um, you know the, the missile technology control regime made the transfer of technology um, and the end user, uh, particularly the end user um, license agreements for that technology, um, particularly difficult and problematic for many of the Gulf states um, or for many of the regional states. So seeing that they had an operational need for capability, which they couldn't get from Western suppliers because those regimes denied it to them, they had to go elsewhere. So they went to places like China and bought Chinese um, UAVs for use in Yemen, for use on the you know, Jordanian-Syrian border. Um, what they found, and this is always one of the one of the arguments that the West will put to um, the Middle East about its its weapons procurement is, yes, but really, it's not as good as ours. So um, the, the, the Chinese drones that are operating in Yemen aren't as effective as the, the American ones. Um, it's interesting that the Jordanians are selling the Chinese drones that they were using on their northern border. Um, we've heard where they may be selling them to, but I'm not sure we need to go into that here. But yeah, I mean, I think when, when you deny... So, so in the past, when you had a... Um, when America really, after after 1971 and the British left the region, America became the security guarantor. Um, and the deal was that you could sell them lots of military equipment, um, but there wasn't really ever a requirement for it to be used. Um, so it didn't have to be operational. The capability didn't have to be turned into a, a true capability. You could buy lots of it, and then it, a lot of it was bought because that was part of a strategic partnership. If you sell an airframe to a country, you have a 25-year contract with them. That's a strategic partnership over 25 years. Um, if you deny them that, then they've got to look elsewhere if they have an operational need. And nowadays, you know, the, since March 2015 with the Saudi-led coalition operation in Yemen, they have an operational need. They need to be able to see a target, um, decide what to do with it, and then apply a resource to it. Um, if you deny them the, 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 the if, not if you deny, if they can't get the equipment that they think they need for that, they're going to look elsewhere in the marketplace.
If I may ask about the uh, developmental needs, because many states in the region, perhaps not so much the, the, the Gulf states, but um, a lot of states in the uh, North Africa, the Levant, they are quite um, um, underdeveloped and a lot of the flaws in, in governance and socioeconomic development have been you know, uh, related to the emergence of these um, non-state armed groups and uh, other, other violent actors. What um, uh, is, is China or any other non-Western countries potentially um, going to, to tap into that, into those um, international development uh, investment in the region? And what's the importance of the US and others as you know, international donors to, to, to build infrastructure, to build um, you know, the state in those, in those regions? Maya's territory probably more than mine. I'm not an expert on their, on their motivations. Um, uh, I think that you know the the those the, the Eastern countries are not looking to supplant American um, security, the security guarantee. Um, some of them are looking to make it appear weak and incoherent. So that's certainly the Russian line. Um, the Chinese line, I suspect, would be you know you had a JCPOA, you broke it, you've got to fix it. Iran's not you know Iran's not our problem; it's your problem. And look at what you've done with it, and we're happy to deal with Iran because it's a sovereign nation. Um, even if you make our trading you make trading restrictions on it very difficult. So I think that um, uh, the that they they the the bottom line of what those eastern countries, particularly China, is putting into developmental work is what I would say is questionable. Um, for, for good or bad, and perhaps I'm displaying my, you know, sort of my um, background here, the developmental stuff that comes from our part of the world generally has l fewer strings attached to it. Yeah, I know I would say as well that uh, China is not looking to fill the same role that the United States has been playing in the, in the region, and the type of actor it will be will just be very different as well. Yes, and I would say that. I mean, I would, I would imagine that's the same for Russia. Russia um, is is playing a very good game, you know. So um, I think I can't remember who it was who said uh, Russia is playing a losing hand very well because its econ economy is so um, is so problematic. But actually, the funny thing is, if you keep playing it, you could still win. And so some of the things that they're doing in the region, again, do they want to be, you know, do they want to have a a Gulf fleet like the Fifth Fleet based out of Bahrain? I suspect not. I don't think their economy could, could cope with it. But do they want to make life difficult for America's Fifth Fleet? Of course they do. Um, so they'll, they'll, they'll have their joint exercises with China and Iran um, to, to, to uh, propose an alternative solution for security. And Iran loves that. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for sharing your insights into the region. It was a fascinating discussion, and we look forward to reading more research that comes out of the Middle East office um, over the course of the year. And thank you to our listeners for joining us today. Please also subscribe to The Sound Strategic for more in-depth discussions like this. And to keep up to date with the latest trends in defense, international security, and armed conflicts, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and we'll see you next time.